I wish they'd get out of my yard so I can go back to bed. I wish they'd get out of my yard so I could go back to bed. Those were the words of Kevin Monahan to the 911 operator about the police who were in his driveway after he shot and killed Kalen Gillis. I wish they'd get out of my yard so I can go back to bed. This trial is about murder in the second degree, reckless endangerment in the first degree, and tampering with evidence. And the evidence in this case is going to be beyond a reasonable doubt that Kevin Monaghan is guilty of all those. There's going to be a number of witnesses in this case that you're going to hear from, 25, 30, maybe more. And as jurors, you're going to have to listen to each of those witnesses. I'm going to try to put them in an order that builds for you. Okay? You have to listen to each testimony, each piece of witness, to get an understanding of what it is this case is going to show you. It's going to be line upon line, you know, precept upon precept, so that you have a particular understanding and knowledge of what happened here. I'm going to go over now the roadmap of what that's going to be. On April 15th, 2023, there were a group of friends hanging out together. Kaylin Gillis, 20 years old, was with Blake Walsh, her boyfriend, 19 years old. They were at Blake Walsh's house in the center of Cambridge area. They were joined by Rory Bain, who's 20 years old. They were joined by Alexandra Whiting, 18, and Jacob Haynes, 19. They were also joined by Catherine Rondu, who sometimes goes by her middle name Jade, she was 18, and Maxwell Barney, Max, he was 16. They were hanging out as teens would often do. There was some alcohol that they were drinking and there was some marijuana that was also present there. They were just hanging out. When they got an invitation to go to Joey Carey's house up in Hebron. Now Joey Carey lives with his father, stepfather, Zachary Bramer, on Hebron Hills Road up in Hebron. When they got the text, they considered their evening. They were fine to drive and they wanted to hang out with other friends as well. So they all got in a vehicle and they drove from the center of Cambridge up to the Hebron area. You'll hear some of them refer to it as the Salem area. Catherine Rondu had been to Joey Carey's house a couple of times in the past, so she took the lead. She was in her Jeep with Maxwell Barney as the front seat passenger. Rory Bain was on a motorcycle. <coughs> he was not on a motorcycle like a Harley. It wasn't a dirt bike. I think it's a 1981 Yamaha 400. It's a very small bike. He had his earbuds in, he had his helmet on, and he followed Catherine. Behind him was Blake Walsh in his mother's Ford Explorer. He was driving. Kaylin Gillis was the front passenger. Alexandria Whiting, goes by Alex, was behind Kaylin Gillis in the rear passenger seat. And in the middle seat was Jacob Haynes. That leaves the seat directly behind Blake Walsh empty. They traveled from the center of Cambridge all the way up to Hebron. Took about 30, 35 minutes. They didn't stop, they didn't speed. They went up there. That's when Catherine Rondu, Rory, and Blake turn into a driveway. It had been mistaken for Hebron Hills Road. Now this driveway is a very long driveway, 800 feet or better, okay? maybe even a half a mile. It turns back from the road at a sharp angle to the right and it goes up a hill. And it goes quite a long distance before it hooks around and comes directly back towards the road. And it continues up a sharp hill. You're going to get all the maps of this. You're going to get aerial photographs. You're going to get composite <coughs> photographs. And as they went up that hill, they stopped about 30 yards before the house because there were no lights on in this house. Catherine stops her vehicle, recognizing it's not the right place. Rory keeps going by her. Blake pulls up right next to her. Blake's car and Catherine's car uh, are directly across from one another. Catherine's window comes down. Kaylin's window comes down so that all the kids, teenagers, kids, 
that they can talk to one another. Rory continued on with his motorcycle. As he continued on with his motorcycle, he came up further to the house to look out behind the house to confirm there's, there's nobody here. This looks abandoned. There's no lights on at all. There's obviously is now not the place. When he makes a U-turn to bring his bike back down to where his friends had stopped. You're gonna learn that that took approximately 20 to 30 seconds. You're gonna learn that when he tried to pull a U-turn because he was in a higher gear going up a hill, he stalled. He had to start his bike, throttle it in order to get it to run and then he basically coasted back down. When he comes back down to the cars, he's now in the middle. He turns his earbuds off. He takes his, I apologize, he leaves his helmet on, but he does turn his earbuds off. So now he can he can hear. And you're gonna find that they all discussed, hey, where are we? We're not at the right place. Some took their phones out, we're looking for GPS, where are we? Others took their phone out, hey, texting friends, we're at the wrong place, where's the address? Now the sum total of time that they were in that location okay, is less than three minutes. And that's something you gotta pay attention to in this trial. The sum total of time as they pulled up to that spot and stopped is less than three minutes. Okay. 30 seconds accounts for Rory to go up and turn around and come back. So realistically, once Rory's now back with them, we're at two and a half minutes, 150 seconds. Okay. They make the determination they need to leave. When approximately the same time, the inside lights come on, the outside lights come on, these kids begin to turn their vehicles around. Rory has already been facing down the driveway so he just has to start his bike and he continues down the driveway. The other two vehicles are facing up the driveway with the house on their right hand side. Now they do a three point turn. They pull away from the house, then they back up towards the house, then they turn down the driveway. Each do a three point turn. One has to go a little bit further ahead in order for them both to do this. Now in Catherine's car, which was the first up, her car is the first down. So as she pulls her car across and backs it up, Max Barney in the front passenger seat is able to look back because he saw the lights come on. And as he looks back, he can see a man at the doorway to this house. That's as they're pulling forward. As they're backing up now with the rear of their vehicle coming to the side of the house, Max is able to look back again and he sees this man on a wraparound deck at the corner of the house closest to them. Now when I tell you that he's looking back like this, I'm looking up. Because where they were 30 yards away, the evidence is gonna show you, they were 23 feet, approximately, lower in elevation than that deck, 30 yards away. And as he looked up, the corner of that deck is the closest <coughs> point to where their vehicle was. And that's where he saw what he believed to be a man. They'll also tell you he thought he saw another individual in the house near the door area. But as his car pulled forward, he couldn't see any further and their car began down the hill. Now while that's happening, Blake, Caitlin, Alex, and Jacob are doing the same thing. They're pulling their car away from the house and they're backing up. Now when they're backing up, Alex in the back seat, she's able to look over her left shoulder through the tinted window up at the house and she also sees a man. She sees a man with a gun. She sees the long barrel of that gun and she sees him on that deck area and she sees the gun pointing out. You're gonna learn in this trial the defendant's left-handed. So this is the way he would have been holding the gun. And that he holds that gun out. She'll tell you she heard the shot and she saw a flash. Now remember, he's 23 feet above this vehicle about 30 yards away. Everyone in that vehicle ducked. They flinched. Five seconds later, there was another shot. Now this vehicle was backing up when that first shot 
came out. Its back was towards the side of the house. Jacob and Blake will tell you they felt like something hit the bumper of their vehicle on that first shot. Puts it in drive as they continue forward within five seconds. They're just starting now down the driveway away from the defendant when a second shot rings out. That shot goes through the metal column between the rear passenger window of this SUV and the rear window. You know, the cargo area window, there's a metal column. You're going to hear that it's called a C pillar, the technical term. That shot goes through there. It was a 20 gauge shotgun with a rifled slug. That slug went through that C pillar exploded out the, the plastic and the felt on the inside of the vehicle, went right across the back passenger seat. Jacob Haynes was not sitting there. He was sitting in the middle. It went right over the shoulder area of the front passenger seat when it entered Kalen Gillis's neck on the right side, and it exited the left side of the neck in the vehicle. It continued through, and it hit the doorway right at the curvature of the door to the, to the dashboard. <clears throat> Jacob Haynes, when that shot came through that car, will tell you that he felt something hit his head. And you'll learn that it was the plastic that it came out into the car, the shrapnel. You'll learn that he couldn't hear out of his left ear almost instantly, and he put his hand right up there and he flinched down. You're going to hear that Alex saw him do that. She'll tell you that she instantly felt that the, the air pressure in this vehicle change. She saw Jacob flinch down, so her attention was on him. Blake is going to tell you, he flinched down. Now, there's a lot of commotion in this car. There's panic now. <clears throat> but Blake was able to keep the car driving. As he keeps the car driving, they're able to ask everyone if they're all right. Jacob says yes. Alex says yes. Blake has asked the question. He's all right. Kalen doesn't answer. They all look at Kalen. It's dark in this car. This is 9.45 at night, 9.50 at night. She is leaning over to her right near the window. Jacob and Alex have to get their phones out to try to turn on the flashlights to see what's going on. And that's when they see the wound on the left-hand side of her neck. Jacob puts his hand on it to try to stop any bleeding. They start using the other phone to try to call 911 as they're going down this driveway. Now, meanwhile, Rory had heard the shots and gotten down the driveway. He continued right up Patterson Hill Road, thinking they were right behind him. He didn't know what had happened, though he heard the shots. <clears throat> Catherine's vehicle comes down and stops at the, at the end of the driveway to continue on, not knowing that a car had been hit, when Blake has to hit his horn several times to get Catherine's attention. I gotta get to a hospital, kaylin has been shot. And so Blake turns to go back towards the village of Hebron, and Catherine pulls in behind him. Now she's behind Blake. They get into the <coughs> intersection of Patterson Hill and 30. And there's, they stop again, and they're yelling back and forth between the car, we need to get to a hospital, we need to go. They're still trying to call 911. <clears throat> Catherine knows the area better, so she takes the lead, and Blake follows her, and they continue on. Meanwhile, Rory now gets to a point where he looks behind him and he sees no one's there, but he can see their lights down into the village. This is because it's April 15th, 2023. There's no leaves on the tree yet. And you'll have your own memories, but you'll also hear what the, the evidence will establish. It was an unseasonably warm April. There were many people outside that night. So he sees their taillights going to the village and he knows that they didn't come that way so he tries to go and find them. Meanwhile, they connect with 911. 911 communications officer, Kelsey Carpenter, who will testify, will tell you that she took a call from them and she calmly, as a professional is supposed to, walked them through what to do. They were not gonna be driving to a hospital they were going to be giving her the location of where they were and stopping so she can send first responders. You're going to hear Stephen Saunders, the fire uh, chief and, and member of uh, first responding units for nearly 30 to 40 years, 
happened to be in the area, coming back from a call, when he hears the radio, by the time he figures out what they're saying, <clears throat> he realizes he has just passed those two vehicles because they were pulling over. So he stops to come to render assistance. He will let you know that other members of uh, paramedics, EMTs arrived, deputies. <clears throat> you will hear from Pete Simino, a paramedic, licensed to be able to declare whether or not someone should be able to continue to have life-saving measures. And he will tell you, after all he received his information, there were no more life-saving measures to be performed. That's the first set of facts. In that set of facts, you're gonna hear from neighbors. You're gonna hear from Jill Nadowski, a neighbor down by the corner of Patterson Hill Road and Route 30. She's gonna tell you she was working late that evening, sitting in her kitchen with her doors and windows open because of how warm it was. She's gonna let you know she saw three vehicles go up Patterson Hill Road, which was odd for her on a Saturday night. No one ever really travels Patterson Hill Road that night, certainly not three vehicles in a row, and it caught her attention. She's gonna tell you that she heard a couple of gunshots happen shortly thereafter, and that within a, a few moments after that, the vehicles came back down. You're gonna hear from Monica Basson. She lived across the street from Jill Nadowski. She has a camera on her house. We're familiar with ring cameras. This one's Eufy, same concept, right? It was on her house. That camera was programmed to record any motion. <clears throat> in fact, it recorded motion. At 9.45, in about 51 seconds, three vehicles go by Monica Basson's house down to <coughs> Route 30 in Patterson Hill Road. And at 9.50, 51, or thereabouts, the three vehicles come back by. Now this is important, because this is the time frame that all that I just said, all that is a lot that I just said, and there's gonna be a lot of witnesses. We're talking about five minutes. And you'll see it probably takes about 45 seconds to a minute to go from that intersection up to the Monaghan residence and about another minute to come back down, so three minutes. Okay. Video evidence that this took place in less than five, and with the testimony in less than three minutes. You're also gonna hear from the Smiths. Now Scott Smith and Tara Smith are in their 60s. <clears throat> Don't hold me to the exact date, but you, you, you'll see them. They happen to be outside their house on this warm night, sitting out, enjoying the sky, the weather, <clears throat> is unseasonably warm for April, when from where they sat behind their house, they have a clear view up the hill to the Monaghan residence. Now there's a lot of trees, but there's no foliage yet, there's no leaves. They're gonna tell you, they also heard these three cars come up. And they could see them on Patterson Hill driving by, they can see them turning to the driveway. They'll tell you that at first, they thought perhaps it was the, the Matthews residence in the back, but in fact, when the vehicles turned up the hill, they realized these three vehicles were going to the Monaghan residence, and that caught their attention. As they watched the three vehicles go up, they're gonna tell you they saw the vehicle stop before the house. They're gonna tell you that the motorcycle went further up and then came right back down. <clears throat> they're gonna tell you that no one was speeding. They're gonna tell you that there was no noises. They didn't hear any horns honking. They didn't hear any voices yelling. They didn't hear any engines revving. But what they did hear, moments after the lights came on in that home, was two gunshots. Scott Smith will tell you he took out his phone to dial 911 because that was something he wasn't sure what to do with. When before he hit send, as he contemplated what to do, he received a call from Jill Madowski. Did you hear the gunshots? So he fit, I'd better call 911, and he calls 911. <clears throat> You're gonna hear from Jinx Monahan. Jinx Monahan is Kevin Monahan's wife. She was there the whole evening as well. She's gonna tell you they went to bed at around 8.30, and at some time later, 
She was woken up by Kevin telling her there was a motorcycle in the driveway and to get away from the windows. She's going to tell you that he reached and grabbed his shotgun, which was right by his bed. Then he went down the stairs of the loft to the door, that the lights of the residence came on, that she heard the door open and him go outside. <clears throat> and while outside, she heard two gunshots and that he comes back inside. She's going to tell you that they then go upstairs and sit on the end of the bed and then decide to go sit at the kitchen table on the first floor. Now, the grade of this land makes the basement on the front of the house what appears to be the first floor because it's a walkout. So the main floor from the front side of the house is the second floor. You have plenty of pictures to show you this. Their house is an A-framed styled house with all windows out the front that can see the entire valley below. They sat there for some 20 to 25 minutes when a car comes up their driveway and puts a spotlight on their house. And this is where you're going to hear from Mark Nelson, Jason Nussbaum, Christopher Murray, and other members of law enforcement. They arrived there and put a spotlight on that house. <clears throat> they had information that a shooting just occurred, that there was a young woman now deceased and they believe this to be the location of where it occurred. They're going to tell you that as they stood there, they tried to get Mr. Monahan to come out of the house and come down to talk to them. So there was some discussion back and forth. When Mr. Monahan calls 911, and when you hear Kelsey Carpenter say, 911, what's your emergency? His first question is, do you guys have a call here? This call is going to be critically important in this case. I'm going to tell you in just a few moments why. But I want you to understand some of the things that the evidence is going to show that he said. Kelsey Carpenter says, let me check, Kevin. She reaches out to <coughs> Officer Nelson, who is on scene. She gets from Officer Nelson that she should tell him that they're there for a noise complaint. She comes back on with Mr. Monahan to say, yeah, the police, are the police are investigating a noise complaint. His response, this is what the evidence is going to show you. This is after he's shot at a vehicle and Kaylin Gillis is now dead. There's been some guys hunting with dogs at night. Maybe that's it. So in response to being told the police are there for a noise complaint, that's his response. He says several times, I was sound asleep. I'm an old man. And then as the conversation continues, he says things like, is he going to be there much longer? It's been really quiet right here. To be honest with you, I fell asleep around 8.30. I haven't heard anything. He repeatedly says he wants to go back to bed. I want to go back to bed, though. I wish they would conclude whatever he's doing and leave me alone. This call is going to be a kind of defining moment in this trial because of what I have to prove. The first charge that you're going to consider is murder in the second degree. That the defendant, on or about April 15th, 2023, in the county of Washington, state of New York, under circumstances evincing a depraved indifference to human life, recklessly engaged in conduct, which created a grave risk of death to another person, and thereby cause the death of another person. Judge has already told you about elements. <clears throat> anything I say about the law, you will know already that whatever the judge says supersedes anything I may say. So if there's any error, it's what the judge says. But we can break this down. The defendant, his identity has to be proven. <clears throat> Excuse me. With Jinx Monahan, there's absolute certainty that he was the man with the gun that was fired. Relative to recklessness, recklessness will be defined to you in greater detail, but it's being aware of a potential circumstance that could happen, disregarding that it could, could happen, and acting anyway. And what's going to be very important in this charge is to understand this. Both shots 
are what constitutes the recklessness. This is important. This case does not separate the two shots. This murder charge encompasses both shots as the act of recklessness. We're not separating these out. You're not considering them separately relative to recklessness. I have to prove that together they form the recklessness. That a man who comes out on a porch, <clears throat> this is what the evidence will show, <clears throat> that a man came out onto his porch, fired a gun twice, under circumstances that he was aware that somebody could be killed, he disregarded it, and he did it anyway. That's one of the elements, reckless. The other element is what's called with a depraved indifference to human life. Now there's, an, there's a long instruction on this. We're gonna have to wait to the end to get that. But I do wanna tell you, we all know the word indifference. To be indifferent is to not care. Under this charge, under this murder charge, it has to be that his indifference was depraved. That it, 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 it's wicked. It's wanton. It's evil, the charge will put in there. So we're not talking intentional murder. There's no intentional murder in this case. This is a case about someone who has recklessly caused the death of another person with a depraved indifference to human life. This is a mindset. That's why this phone call is important. When you listen to this phone call, what I want you to listen for the evidence is going to show there were no signs of nervousness. There's no shaking voice. There's no stammering. There's no stuttering. There's no searching for words. Um, uh, uh. There's none of that. You're going to hear on this phone call, someone is calm, cool, and collected. You're going to hear the responses to questions that are already given, right? I've already read to you those statements he said. Those are statements that are gonna show that he has a depraved indifference to human life. When the police are there, he is giving the 911 operator false leads, false information after he shot at a vehicle. That shows an indifference to the value of the human life of the people in those cars. <clears throat> the other charge I'm going to ask you to consider at the end of this is <coughs> reckless endangerment in the first degree. That the defendant, on or about April 15th, 2023, in the county of Washington, state of New York, under circumstances evincing a depraved indifference to human life, he recklessly engaged in conduct which created a grave risk of death to another person. The murder charge is because Kalen Gillis was murdered. The reckless endangerment charge, basically the same concept, with a depraved indifference, recklessly engaged in conduct that <clears throat> created a grave risk of death to another person. The difference with this charge is that it's for the individuals, all the individuals involved. The murder charge is Kaylin Gillis. Reckless endangerment first is everyone, including Kaylin. Okay? <clears throat> what you're gonna hear after all of this is that investigators came to the scene, they had search warrants, they brought the New York State Forensic Investigation Unit, you had members of the Washington County Sheriff's, the New York State Police, the Cambridge Greenwich Police Department, the Granville Police Department. And when the Washington County Sheriffs brought in the New York State Police Forensic Investigation Unit, they went and searched the entirety of this property for evidence, the entirety of the inside of this house for evidence. They took 3D imaging of the entire property. They took drone photographs of the entire property. You're going to get a lot of photographs in this case. One of the things they were looking for outside the house is they were looking for the shotgun shells that had been fired. You're going to hear that once you fire a shotgun shell in a pump action shotgun, you have to pump out the expended shell. That comes out of the gun. Maybe a foot, maybe two, but it comes out. 
<clears throat> and you have to rack in the next round. There was another shot fired. And you're going to hear that when shots are fired, inside that shell, there's the ammunition, the bullet, there's the wadding behind the bullet, and then there's the gunpowder. And of course, now the empty shell. So there's a number of things to look for when we're looking for a fired uh, bullet. You're going to hear that nothing was found outside. No <coughs> wadding, no shells. You're going to hear they brought a canine to help them search. One qualified to search for gunpowder and explosives. Judge, I have no object to this. Can we approach, please? Certainly. Um, Attorney Morris had mentioned in his opening that there, the presence of a, of a dog uh, at the scene, and I'm going to ask you to, to disregard that, okay? Do you want to be heard in further than Attorney Morris? No, thank you. Attorney Frost? No, you're right. Okay. Uh, then you can continue. Thank you. You're going to hear from Washington County Sheriff Senior Investigator Harold Spezio. He is the lead detective from the Sheriff's Department that handled this investigation. You're going to hear that he had search warrants for the property in the house, and that he helped, he was aided by the help of the New York State Police Forensic Investigation Unit. They came to the property, they did a grid search of the property for all the components of that ammunition that I was telling you about. They did a grid search in the area where they believed the fire the shots had uh, been fired at, all the way up to, including on the deck and under the deck, and nothing was found. They searched the inside of the house, where right next to the bed of Kevin Monahan and Jinx Monahan on the on Kevin's side of the bed was the shotgun. You're going to hear the shotgun was unloaded when it was found, and you're going to hear that the safety was mostly engaged, almost all the way on. Now that's an important fact in this case to pay attention to. We're talking about the depraved indifference and recklessness. That the gun is returned without ammunition and the safety into the engaged tells you that it was handled after the shooting. What you're going to find out from the forensic investigation unit is that they take that gun and they spray a particular kind of spray on there, an adhesive, the kind of mist and adhesive that goes down onto the, the gun and they look for what's called latent prints, fingerprints. They find none. They're going to tell you that they swabbed the gun in all the common areas that it would have been handled. You're going to find out that they submitted that to see if there was any samples of DNA suitable for comparison. You're going to find out that at the pump part of the shotgun, out near the barrel, there was enough DNA to confirm that Kevin Monahan handled that gun. But what you're going to find out is at the trigger, at the stock, where the, the trigger hand holds it, there was insufficient DNA to determine who, who held it there. You're going to hear that there was no gunshot residue in the barrel fingerprints, a lack of DNA in the trigger, no gunshot residue in the barrel, and you're going to find out that they don't have the shot shells. That's what comprises the tampering with evidence. Objection, Judge. Can we approach, please? So once again, there was an objection made. We had a sidebar. That's a conference where the attorneys come up here, and uh, I think we came up with a way to, to resolve the issue. Attorney Morris. Thank you. When we get to the tampering charge, and and let me read this to you because I have to establish this by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. That the defendant, on or about April 15, 2023, in the county of Washington, state of New York, believing that certain physical evidence was about to be produced or used in an official proceeding or a prospective official proceeding, and with the intent to prevent such production or use, he suppressed such evidence by an act of concealment, <coughs> alteration, or destruction. And for this charge, that is the lack of gunshot residue in the barrel, the lack of fingerprints on the gun, and the missing shells. That's what I'm going to prove to you. One of the ways that we'll establish that is that the evidence in this trial is going to show you 
that during the time frame between the shots going off and the police arriving, you're going to hear from the Smiths. They're going to tell you they sat in their backyard and they continued to pay attention to what was going on. They saw the lights come on the hill, they heard the gunshots, they saw the lights go off. They're going to tell you that they then saw small lights up at the house moving around. You're also going to hear from an officer, Jason Nussbaum. He's going to tell you that when he first arrives, and there is a communication back and forth between some of the officers at, down by the garage area looking way up at the house, that he could see an individual go into the basement, walk around, and then go up to the second floor, the loft area. In other words, there's a lot of moving around, is what the evidence is going to show. The opportunity. You're going to hear that Mr. Monahan changed his clothes before the law enforcement was able to uh, take him in custody. <clears throat> what I want you to do is to bring to this trial everything that you've already said that you would. The ability to make inferences, the ability to assess credibilities, the ability to look at surrounding facts and circumstances to determine intent, state of mind, motive. I want you to bring that in here. I don't want you to leave it at the door. I want you to hear the testimony, and again, it's going to come in literally line upon line, and you're going to be able to collectively weigh that and assess that, and I submit to you at the end of the day, there will be proof beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. I'm going to sum this up to you at the end of the trial. This was what the evidence is going to be. Wait till the end to hear how it meets these charges. Keep an open mind. Hold me to my burden. Thank you.